One of these nights I'm going to be able to open the show. Thanks, Chris. Thanks to your home for joining us this hour. And then I'm not going to have to say, hey, we're in the middle of breaking news and we're about to do things in a way that's unusual and I had to throw away half the show. I mean, I, one of these nights we will get to the shore of normal news. We are not yet on that blissful shore. Uh, tear up the show. Let's start with a developing story again this evening. Uh, late this evening, Senate Republicans announced they've scheduled a potential vote on the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh uh, to the United States Supreme Court. That nomination, of course, has been in turmoil uh, since allegations arose of sexual misconduct against Brett Kavanaugh, including one case uh, of alleged attempted rape. Um, the allegations center on his time in high school and in college. Judge Kavanaugh has roundly, flatly, repeatedly denied all of it. Dr. Christine Blasey Ford says that Brett Kavanaugh assaulted her and tried to rape her when he was 17. She has requested that the Judiciary Committee, uh, considering his nomination and the White House, uh, they should allow the FBI to reopen its background check of Brett Kavanaugh to look into her allegations about this alleged attempted rape. Senate Republicans said no to that. Dr. Ford also asked for the committee to take testimony from witnesses who she said could potentially corroborate elements of her story. Senate Republicans also said no to that. She further asked for senators to at least question her themselves rather than appoint outside lawyers to question her as if she was being put on trial herself for some kind of wrongdoing. Republicans not only said no to that, they announced today that they've appointed an experienced former prosecutor to question Dr. Ford in front of the Senate. Uh, and they won't say who it is. It's a secret. Um, nevertheless, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford is now scheduled to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee on this matter on Thursday morning. And now this evening, Senate Republicans have announced that they think they'll be ready to vote on, Kav on Kavanaugh's nomination the very next day. First thing, Friday morning which apparently means they plan to move forward on a vote without ever hearing testimony from the second accuser who came forward after Christine Blasey Ford uh, with a second serious claim about Judge Kavanaugh. Her name is Deborah Ramirez. Ms. Ramirez spelled out her allegation against Brett Kavanaugh in The New Yorker in an article that was published this weekend. She said essentially that uh, when she was in college and Brett Kavanaugh was a classmate of hers as an undergraduate, he uh, put his genitals in her face, forcing her to touch them uh, as she tried to push him away. Uh, quoting from The New Yorker, quote, I was embarrassed and ashamed and humiliated. She says she remembers Brett Kavanaugh standing to her right and laughing, pulling up his pants. Brett was laughing, she said. I can still see his face and his hips coming forward like when you pull up your pants. She recalled another male student shouting about the incident. Quote, somebody yelled down the hall, Brett Kavanaugh just put his penis in Debbie's face. She said it was his full name. I don't think it was just Brett. And I remember hearing and being mortified that this was out there. Another classmate of Debbie Ramirez's told The New Yorker that while he himself was not present at that party, he says he is, quote, 100 percent sure that he was told at the time that Brett Kavanaugh was the student who had exposed himself to Ms. Ramirez. So after that allegation was published this weekend, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, she's the top Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, she asked for a further delay in the confirmation proceedings for Brett Kavanaugh. So this allegation could also be looked at. Uh, tonight, the Republican Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley rejected that request from Dianne Feinstein. He said he sees no reason why sh there should be any further delay. Uh, and he sees no reason why Ms. Ramirez um, should be invited to testify or to participate in the hearing that's been called for Thursday. Why wouldn't they want to hear from her? I mean, they're holding the hearing already. The attorney for Deborah Ramirez says um, she stands by her story. Um, and she has been trying to get her story to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Ms. Ramirez's attorney says tonight, quote, Deborah Ramirez only came forward after being contacted by Ronan Farrow at The New Yorker and carefully working through her memories only to ensure her accuracy. We reached out to the Senate Judiciary Committee to schedule a call to discuss how best to bring them that information. And they have refused to meet all scheduled appointments. Hmm. 
We have officially requested an FBI investigation, and our client remains adamant that that is the appropriate venue for her to discuss her trauma. Ms. Ramirez is ready to swear to the FBI under penalty of perjury. Why won't the Senate Judiciary Committee welcome that? You can hear her attorney. Her attorney's name is John Clune. You can hear him sort of asking out loud publicly why the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is hearing the nomination of this man for the Supreme Court, why they wouldn't want to hear testimony from his client, uh, why they wouldn't want to receive information from his client about that nominee that they are considering. Um, and it, do, it does seem a little mysterious why Senate Republicans are not waiting for her allegations to be heard. Uh, and in fact, even the White House said today, uh, basically, yeah, maybe she should testify. How about that same day that Dr. Ford's gonna be there on Thursday? Does the president want Ms. Ramirez to appear, to appear before the Senate Judiciary Committee as well? Uh, certainly we would be open to that, uh, and that process could take place on Thursday. Certainly. White House could be open to that. It's our nominee. Could take place on Thursday. Uh, but that is apparently not what's going to happen. Tonight, Senate Republicans are not just saying uh, they don't see what the testimony of one woman might have to do with the testimony of the other woman. Not only are they not waiting to hear from Deborah Ramirez, um, they are bulldozing ahead, preparing to vote the day after they could hear from that accuser, but they've decided they won't. Why are Republicans trying to move this so fast? Why do they not want this new person's testimony before they vote, particularly because she's offering to testify under pain of perjury? Um, and if, as uh, Mr. Klune says, there has been contact, that they have made an effort to contact the Senate Judiciary Committee, but the Judiciary Committee is refusing to meet all scheduled appointments to discuss this allegation against Brett Kavanaugh, I mean, my basic question here is, is this a live issue now? Is it possible that she would still testify or that the committee in some other way uh, will hear her allegation? Uh, joining us now is the attorney who represents Deborah Ramirez in this matter, John Clune. Mr. Clune, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I appreciate you making time for us. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so you said publicly today that um, you have reached out to the Senate Judiciary Committee um, that there was an effort made to um, discuss how best to bring him in for this information that's been put forward um, by your client. Can you tell us this, the status of those discussions or those negotiations? Sure. So we've had a number of email communications back and forth, and, and every time we try to set up a phone call with them, um, they end up pushing the phone call back. And then since I sent out that tweet about two hours ago, we had a phone call scheduled, and, and we called in for the phone call, and only the minority party showed for the phone call. So the, uh, you received communication from the chairman or the chairman's staff, from the majority committee staff, but then only Democrats were on the call? That's correct. What do you make of that? That seems odd. You know, it's it's disturbing. They they you know they keep on kind of changing the what the rules of how they want to go forward. And and every time that we talk about want to talk about how that's going forward and just discuss it on the phone, then they push it back. So, I mean, it's hard to to see that they're really interested in getting the information that Ms. Ramirez has. In terms of Ms. Ramirez um, and this allegation that she's made against Judge Kavanaugh, it, it was explained in the New Yorker um, when Jane Mayer and Ronan Farrow's piece that. Uh, Ms. Ramirez did not come forward and offer her story to these reporters, but rather these reporters approached her after they had heard about this incident from other people. Uh, they suggested and in fact said in their piece that uh, your client, Ms. Ramirez, is, uh, was, was reluctant and unsure about whether or not she wanted um, to make this allegation publicly or have her name associated with it. Can you shed any more light for us on her, her thought process and, and what she's been through um, over the past few days as this allegation has come to light? Yeah, sure. I mean, she, she received a phone call from Ronan Farrell one day, a, a voice message when she was at, at work at the Boulder uh, County Health and Human Services. She had not talked about this matter for uh, many years prior to this, and she had a hard time deciding whether or not to call Mr. Farrell back, and then she started getting some other messages from other reporters, and it was obvious this wasn't going to, to go away, and so she made the decision to go ahead and, and cooperate with Mr. Farrell, but she certainly wasn't um, seeking out um, you know, any uh, public disclosure of this on her own, and she was just responding to the call that she got, and she responded and told as candidly as she could um, the recollections that she had about what happened. 
The fact that other people may have alerted reporters to her story, uh, that it didn't come from her, um, raises the issue. Obviously, that, that tells, us a, tells us something about the human factor of what she's going through here in terms of learning that her name might become public, learning that these reporters were already discussing her uh, with regard to this allegation. It also raises the issue of corroborating witnesses and whether or not there were people who were aware that this had happened, who had reason to be talking about it, who had reason to be speaking to reporters about it. Um, in terms of Ms. Ms. Ramirez and her recollections, her allegation here, can you tell us if there are corroborating witnesses, if there are other people who she either spoke to at the time or close to the time of the incident or who knew about the incident that when it happened, who would be willing also to speak publicly about it now? Right. Well, there have been, and, and some of those witnesses were identified in the New Yorker piece, and some of those witnesses didn't cooperate but still could be interviewed by the FBI um, should that be the direction that the investigation turns. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of question that this actually happened. I mean, you have a situation where there are a number of people who were interviewed who said, yes, they heard about it, they heard about it that night, they heard about it within a couple days afterwards. Some of the people that were fellow Yale students were talking about it openly in the past month on email saying, I wonder if this story is going to come forward. So I don't think there's any question that the, the incident actually occurred. I mean, Judge Kavanaugh might suggest that it's a case of mistaken identity, but something clearly occurred. Our, our client disclosed to her mother and her sister 35 years ago about what happened. There's plenty more people that need to be contacted that if there's going to be a real investigation and find out what happened, that can be. But at this point, it doesn't look like there's at least much of a momentum for that to take place. In terms of the discussions that you have tried to start with the Senate Judiciary Committee as they consider Judge Kavanaugh's nomination, have any of those discussions included the possibility of other people also offering testimony to the committee or being interviewed by committee investigators? Uh, has that either come up or is that part of what you would be willing to talk with the committee about? Here's the problem, Rachel, is they won't talk to us. I mean, the minority party spoke to us for the very first time tonight and the majority party wouldn't speak to us. So we don't know what they're, what they're willing to do. The demand that they keep making of us is give us every piece of information that you have now and then we can talk about scheduling a phone call. And that's just not you know, the kind of partisan game playing that you know, our client deserves. That's not fair to her. Why do you see that as uh, partisan game playing? Just as, as an attorney in terms of advising your client here, why, does that, um, uh, why is that something that you don't want to do? You know, the, the, the idea that they won't even talk to her counsel about what the process might look like, what the options are, uh, that tells me that whatever they're planning, it's either going to be by ambush or it's going to be used as just a footnote to the confirmation process and this will all be dealt with within a few days. We do now have some detail tonight in terms of how this hearing is going to go on Thursday, at least how the majority is suggesting the Thursday hearing is going to go. Uh, they've suggested that uh, the Republicans on the Senate committee will not themselves ask questions of Christine Blasey Ford. They will instead essentially have a pinch hitter to come in, uh, an outside counsel who will ask questions on their behalf. Uh, they've also said there will just be five minutes per senator uh, for questioning, and there will be a single round. Nobody will be allowed to ask any follow-up questions or come around for a second um, for a mm -hmm. second round of questioning. We also know basic things in terms of the timing uh, of the committee hearing, which test, which witness will go first, when there will be a break in between the two witnesses, and those sorts of details. Given what's been spelled out about that 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 uh, hearing on Thursday, if the committee changed course and was willing to talk to you about the circumstances and was willing to invite testimony from your client along those same lines, along those same logistical constraints, would your, would your client testify? You know, I'll, I'd let her make that decision, but I wouldn't advise it. That's a very unfair process. I mean, one of the, you know, I was a former prosecutor and, and, you know, a case that's 35 years old, the only way you're going to get at what actually happened besides talking to the two people who are involved is talking to the corroborating witnesses for both sides. And if this is going to be a process where Judge Kavanaugh and either Dr. Ford or, or Debbie Ramirez um, are taking questions, you know, you're never going to find out what really happened or you're certainly um, not going to find out any corroboration. It makes it a lot easier to just ignore these women if they're just going to question the actual women and Judge Kavanaugh. 
Mr. Clune, I know you've said that you want and your client wants to speak to the FBI and would happily do so under pain of, of perjury in, in order to have this matter investigated properly. Uh, the White House and Republicans in the Senate appear adamantly dug in against that prospect. They do not want the FBI to reopen its background investigation of Judge Kavanaugh. If they will not budge on that issue specifically, um, how, how else would you want to proceed? If, an, if the FBI investigation isn't going to happen, what do you think should happen next here in terms of having your client treated fairly and having this allegation considered fairly? Well, I, first of all, I think that would be a, a real failure on the part of the Senate Judiciary Committee if they were not to open an FBI investigation. We've really had only one process for the background investigations into potential Supreme Court nominees for many, many years. The only way that is actually not a partisan process is for the FBI to do the investigation. So that, that would really be a failure on the part of the Senate if that's the route they, they um, decided. If they decided um, to do something like, or not, not do something like that and just um, go forward, I would have to talk to the Senate Judiciary Committee. The fact that they refuse to actually get on the phone with me and talk to me about what other options they might have in mind and instead just sit back and demand that I give them all the information that we have, which feels like an, uh, an effort to just gather the information and sweep it under the rug, then it's hard to, to say that I would, I would suggest that she do anything further. But uh, they need to be able to have a meaningful conversation with Debbie Ramirez's counsel and talk about what other options they're proposing if it's not going to be FBI. I don't know what that would be, but, um, but I'd love to talk to them about it. John Clune, uh, attorney representing Debbie Ramirez in this matter. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I know uh, you, you, you got to us tonight on short notice. Thanks for being here, sir. Thanks, Rachel. Um, again, underscoring what's going on there. Uh, this is news tonight. So Deborah Ramirez is the second woman to come forward with a serious allegation um, of, of sexual misconduct against Judge Brett Kavanaugh, who's up for a Supreme Court nomination. Uh, her attorney telling us tonight um, that she wants to talk to the FBI, that she volunteers to talk to the FBI, that both her and people who could be corroborating witnesses for her account uh, should be interviewed by the FBI. Uh, but Separate and apart from that, um, her counsel telling us that while there have been um, there has been a concerted effort by her and through counsel to reach out to the Senate Judiciary Committee to provide this information, um, the Republicans on the committee are literally not showing up on the phone calls that they have set up to discuss how she might get them this information. Only Democrats are joining those calls, even after the Republicans, uh, the Republican chairman and his staff set those things up. Um, why the Republicans would refuse to even negotiate over how to obtain this information, um, that's, that's unusual. I might suggest to the Senate Judiciary Committee tonight, there may have been some misunderstanding here. That's the best possible spin I could put on this. If this is a misunderstanding, you can clear it up by calling John Clune. You have his number. Much more ahead tonight. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.